Okay, well, welcome everybody. It's uh, wonderful to have you uh, join us for our first of what we hope to be now a monthly Wednesday class on various topics in Jewish uh, thought and halacha. And this class will take place all the time on Wednesday nights, except when it won't. Um, and uh, for example, next week, we will not be able to meet on Wednesday night. Next week, we'll meet on Tuesday night for the second part of this series of Israel at War. And then and hopefully we'll, the next Wednesday after that, we're gonna be making up the Matt Levitt lecture uh, on Hezbollah and Hamas, who had to reschedule, and then we'll get back to uh, my teaching. But uh, for tonight, uh, we have a really interesting topic. And our topic uh, for tonight is the question of protests and, uh, and rallies. And the question of where does this notion, is there a Jewish source for this idea of protests and rallies? Um, what has been uh, the history of participation in protests and rallies? And we're also going to spend some time on a particular controversy that arose out of the, uh, the most recent protest uh, that uh, many of us were at in Washington, in Washington, D.C., uh, so let's uh, let's jump right in to the sources that uh, deal with protests and rallies. And um, the first, uh, what, I, what, I, what I'd like to start with, and and by the way, feel free to uh, ask any questions uh, as we as we go, um, and to to either just jump right in and ask a question, or to use the uh, raise hand function. Um, when uh, uh, and I'll try to uh, take note of you. I'm also I'm sort of doing the uh, the tech as well as uh, teaching the class. So um, if I miss you, just unmute yourself and try to uh, get my my attention. So I hope you could see the the screen. And I thought I would just start with one or two um, Jewish sources um, that may indicate a um, a responsibility to actually participate uh, in the type of rally that many of us went to in, uh, in Washington uh, just, um, just a few weeks ago. Uh, for example, uh, we have a pasuk in the Torah that says, Can you do any effect? Lo, uh, Serena, are you okay? Can you hear? Okay, I'm just going to um, mute everyone. And if you need so. to say anything, just, um, just unmute yourself, okay? Um, so one source that may lead to uh, the conclusion that it's important to participate in these types of rallies uh, is uh, the Pasuk in the Torah that says, Lo ta'amod al damriyecha, right? We should not stand idly by the, uh, the, blood of, uh, the blood of our brothers. And that's the first Pasuk that you see on top of the, on top of the screen. And uh, it, it, Sort of expanding on that, we have uh, we have the Rambam in Hilchot Tshuva um, that says, uh, essentially teaching us that every individual uh, makes a difference. And there's a fascinating Rambam um, that says, when it comes to repentance, he says, "Asay mitzvah achat harichriat atzmo v'kol haolam kulo lekaf zechut." That if a person performs one mitzvah, like uh, imagine a, one, a person is uh, perfectly balanced between uh, mitzvah merit and demerit, and a person does one mitzvah, uh, they can uh, tip the balance, their balance and the balance of the entire world to the side of merit. And I thought this was an interesting uh, source um, that deals with uh, the importance of showing up, right? That every act that we do can make a difference. I, I, I'm pretty sure that Dr. Seuss got this from the Rambam and not the other way around. If you've ever read the book Horton Hears a Who, it's very much the same, uh, the same uh, message. And um, I don't know if Dr. Seuss read uh, read the Rambam, but it's uh, it's a very it's a very similar message. We have this idea of Lo Tamod Al Dam and this notion that every person, uh, every person makes makes a difference. So, with that in mind, um, and every action makes a difference. So, with that in mind, let's jump 
into um, what I believe is the earliest source in, uh, well, I shouldn't say it's the earliest source of protest, uh, because we have we have examples of protest in the Torah, right? Avraham protested against the destruction of Sodom. Uh, Yaakov protested when his sons uh, killed Shechem and the, the people of that city uh, who had who had uh, who had raped Dina. Uh, but that's not a type of mass protest uh, that we are talking about. Uh, and nor is that a protest against, let's say, a governmental decision. Although you could maybe say that Yaakov, that Avram's argument with God against destroying Sodom was an argument against the government, because God, I guess, is the, the ultimate government. Um, but we're ta- talking about things which are more similar to the type of protests that we that we attend. We have a really fascinating story uh, that appears in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, which you see here on your screen. And the story is as follows. Mativ Raftuvi Bar Matna, Be'esrim Vitamnanya Be'i, so Rav Tuvi Barmata Marta raised an objection. There was a discussion in the Talmud, and it says on the 28th of Adar, the good tidings came to the Jews that they should not turn away from Torah on that day. Fasting is forbidden. Why? Why was fasting forbidden on that day? And the Gemara explains, She gazra malchut harisha'a gizera shelo ya'asok Yasoku Batara, that the uh, evil uh, the the um, the uh, evil kingdom, the wicked kingdom made a decree that the Jews are not allowed to study uh, Torah, Vishalo Yamulu at Binehem, and that they are not allowed to uh, circumcise their children, Vishalu Shabbatot, and that they are not allowed to keep Shabbat. It's unclear exactly what that means that they were not allowed to clear, clear, uh, clear, uh, keep Shabbat. Were, were there, you know, soldiers going around forcing people uh, to break Shabbat? Uh, we'll see another commentary a little bit later that suggests that maybe it means that they created conditions for the people that it was impossible to keep Shabbat, maybe making them work on Shabbat. Many of us are familiar with the stories of people who came to America and when they told their boss they weren't going to be there on Saturday. The boss said, well, if you don't show up on Saturday, don't show up on Sunday uh, type of situation. So maybe that's what it means. Anyway, this was the uh, the decree that was going on, and they didn't know what to do. So the Gemara says, <clears throat> Ma'asa, what did they do? Ma'asa Yehuda ben Shemua v'chavirav. What did Yehuda ben Shemua and his colleagues do? Holchu they went and took advice from a certain matron whom all the prominent men of Rome would visit regularly, thinking that she would know what to do. So it's unclear uh, what this, who, who this matron was and why the Romans used to visit her. We could, I'm sure we all have our own theories as to why that is. Maybe she was an expert theoretician in how to uh, interrun the government, or maybe she had expertise in other areas, unclear. But um, um, but uh, anyway, they went. the rabbis went to speak to her because they knew that she had an understanding of what makes these people tick and, and what they could do to overcome this decree. And listen to what she told them. Amra lahem, she said to them, Bo'u v'hafginu balayla. So you see that word, hafginu, that's the modern Hebrew word for a protest. If you've been in Israel and there's a protest, you went to a hafgana. Right? That's the Hebrew word here. Bo'u v'hafginu balayla. And we'll get into some of the details, actually, why she said it should actually take place at night. Bo'u v'hafginu balayla. Go and protest at night. Holchu v'hafginu balayla. So they, in fact, followed her instruction. Amru, a shamayin, lo achechem anachnu. They said, oh heavens, are we Jews, not your brothers? Lo b'nei av echad anachnu. Are we not children of one father? Lo b'nei em echad anachnu. Are we not children of one mother? 
Ma nishtanenu mikol uma vilashon shatem gozrim alenu gizerot kashot. How are we different than every other nation that you are issuing such harsh decrees against us? And lo and behold, what happened? Ubitlum. The Romans annulled the decrees. This is an example in the Talmud of a successful rally. They went to the capital, like we did, right? And they made their claim. They made their speech. They had a particular approach, which we'll get to. And uh, they... Uh, the Romans listened and, in fact, annulled the decree. And so what happened? Voto hayom asa'uhu yom tov. The sages made that day a festive day. So here we have an example of a successful hafkana. And uh, what we're going to do in a few minutes, we're going to stop in a second and take uh, comments or questions if everyone has. We'll do in a few minutes after seeing uh, one or two other sources is we're going to break down we're going to see a tshuva that breaks down virtually line by line, in some cases, word by word, this tshuva, to gain a halachic understanding, if you will, about the, um, the, 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 the a Jewish view on, on how we should view these type of hapkanot, these type of protests. But before we move on, I want to stop here and ask if anyone noticed anything interesting out of the ordinary, curious, or just anything you may have picked up from that particular uh, source uh, in the in the Gemara. Okay, uh, Mr. Ropart, just unmute yourself, please. Um, hi. So, just two things uh, stood out. One is the woman, I'm trying to think of what type of woman could this be who the Romans are consulting, and one idea I had is perhaps she was an oracle. But if she was an oracle, it would be particularly weird for the Jews to be going and consulting her uh, because, you know, that's we don't usually um, go that way. And and the right. one notable person who did was King Stahl and things didn't end too well for him. Right. Right. So it, the, it, 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 I don't I don't think anyone suggests that. I think they suggest that she may have been a uh, businesswoman um, or she may have also been just uh, like like well known. And she actually knew what she was talking about. She was like a, she was a consultant. Okay, yeah. yeah. And so, and then just the other thing is, I'm aware that during the Spanish Inquisition, and it was a, a little bit different because they were trying to root out people who had falsely converted to Christianity. Um, the inquisitors would go on cold nights and see on, on, on Friday nights and see where, who had smoke coming out of their chimneys and who didn't have smoke coming out of their chimneys. And then you could find yourself on the, you know, inquisitorial, um, you know, mm -hmm. torture or punishment if you didn't. And so maybe it was some similar thing that if you weren't spotted intentionally doing something in violation, mm -hmm. that there would be some type of punishment. Ah, great. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Any other uh, comments? Yes, Robert Hartofsky. Thank you for joining. Thank you. What, what was the cry out to heaven? What was it said? I said, oh, Shemaya. They're not yeah. really. Were, were they looking up at heaven, or is, is heaven a nickname for the ruling authority? Because it doesn't make sense to say, if looking up to God in heaven, we are your brothers, we're the son of the same father. Who, what is that phrase, Shemaya? What, what is that about? So it could be just like, oh, like, 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 oh my God, even though we're not really, when we say something like that, um, addressing addressing god it could have been like a turn of phrase that's that's used um or um it could have been uh sort of a a dual address like they're addressing heaven and they're also addressing uh because maybe you read it the oshamaya like they're davening they need help and then they say the other stuff yeah okay any uh any other uh, questions or thoughts on that? Uh, I see the Lowenthal's have a hand up. Yeah, so it seems like that it's pretty much the same stuff that we're saying right now. Okay, you go ahead. You want to expand on that? You know, like, um, are we not the same people? Why is there a double standard? Why? why 
you know, like this kind of like not understanding we're participating in a society. Why are we being judged differently? Why is there a decree against Jews for no particular reason? And it seems very, very, very similar as what we're doing right now. Okay. And, and as you reflect on that, how does that feel? Um, not so good. It's not so good. Like nothing's we're, changed. We're fighting, we're fighting old, we're still fighting old battles. On the other hand, it could be comforting that nothing's changed, that what we're dealing with, we have a history to look back on uh, for advice and, and to call upon uh, sort of uh, the historical record to say, how did our ancestors deal with this? Uh, and also that they, since they survived it the last time, collectively, uh, mm -hmm. we'll collectively make it through this time. You're the okay. eternal optimist. I love it. <laughs> Great. I just play one by day. <laughs> Well, it's okay. also interesting to look at the context. It's in Masacha Rosh Hashanah. So Rosh Hashanah is the idea of, you know, changing ourselves to change our, our future. Um, and so with this protest, it's saying, you know, if you go out and do something, then, you know, the gazar will change. Ah, very nice. Okay, so maybe a metaphor for tshuva. Excellent. Okay. Um, although we have to be careful there, I think, Chaim, because we don't want to get into the situation where those bad, we blame ourselves for those bad decrees. Like when it comes to, right, we have to be, on one hand, Cuba is actually about blaming ourselves, but we don't necessarily want to blame ourselves for what other people are doing, especially if we don't have like like a Navi or someone, you know, telling us why these things happened. Hold on, bad uh, things don't happen to us because we forgot to check the mezuzah? <laughs> um, I, I don't generally subscribe oh. to, to such theology. Poi, 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 poi. <laughs> okay, or that. Okay, um, here we go. I want to uh, share now, before we get to um, the analysis of that Gemara, I want to share a few passages related to um, Rabbi Soloveitchik. Um, can you see the screen? Okay. So uh, this is really interesting. Um, a, there are a few uh, passages I recently came across um, about Rabbi, from Rabbi Soloveitchik uh, about his thoughts, and we'll get to other people's thoughts as well, about these type of protests. So in Kol Do Di Do Fake, which is essentially Rabbi Soloveitchik's book-length essay in response to the Shoah, uh, even though it was only written, I believe, after the Six Day War, um, but this is his theological response to the Shoah, he writes this really intriguing passage. During the terrible Holocaust, when European Jewry was being systematically exterminated in the ovens of the crematoria, the American Jewish community did not rise to the challenge. Now, it's not that they didn't try, but there, we do have some uh, we do have um, a, a, a march on Washington. I thank uh, uh, Mr. Ropart for uh, sending me um, an essay outlining a number of Jewish marches. And one of them, which he says is the first significant gathering in Washington, was 1943 to free the Jews from Nazi camps. That was only the Orthodox rabbinate. Uh, 400 rabbis gathered at the U.S. Capitol. And the, the level of success of that uh, particular rally um, is um, is debatable. Um, it wasn't a slam dunk, as we would have hoped uh, in a situation like that. Boris Soloveitchik says, the American Jewish community did not rise to the challenge, did not act as Jews possessing a properly developed consciousness of our shared fate and shared suffering. And maybe that's an allusion to that only the Orthodox were at that march as well as the obligation of shared action that follows therefrom ought to have acted. We did not sufficiently empathize with the anguish of the people and did very little to save our afflicted brethren. I mean, this is a really remarkable um, comment of, of uh, talk about guilt and, and blame, right? How, how Rabbi Soloveitchik is essentially, and, he, and I think he's including himself, that you know we didn't flex our political muscle um, and our and and whatever type of other things we could have done in in, in that realm uh, during the Shoah, 
and and the reason uh, uh, goes back maybe to the first source I said of Lo Tamod Al Damreyecha that there wasn't a, a a developed sense that what's happening to uh, European Jewry is our problem, uh, and um, and and that's going to play a role uh, in a in a in a later conversation that's recorded. Um, with Rabbi Soloveitchik, which I have here. This comes from uh, a, a a journal called Chakira. Um, the, the 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 article is not partic- is not specifically about um, um, it's not particularly about rallies. It's about Jewish leadership and how Jewish leadership has manifested itself. So here in this uh, passage, a conversation between one of Rabbi Sol- between Rabbi Soloveitchik and one of his students. Is is recorded, and um, this is it's also fascinating. Rabbi Dr. Aaron Adler was a student uh, in the Rabbi Isaac Alchanan Theological Seminary, that is the rabbinical school of Yeshiva University. When he when he was the Rav's chauffeur, I just want to point out that I do not have a chauffeur. Um, just I'm just I know that I see that Noah's on the line, pointing that out. Um, Rabbi Gerson, I don't know if you ever had a chauffeur, Rabbi Chaitovsky. I will tell you, by the way, just a, a little humorous situation. When I became the rabbi of the school in Montreal, and uh, uh, the first funeral uh, was, I had to do my first funeral, um, I got a phone call from the um, from the funeral parlor. Rabbi Gelman, I just want to remind you, the funeral is at 11 o'clock. There'll be a car to pick you up at 10.30. It's like, oh. Okay, that's nice. And uh, then I found out that my predecessor was notoriously late. And so they arranged for him always to be picked up by a car. And they just kept that minha going when I took over. So I, for a little while, I did have uh, a chauffeur, but only for funerals. Okay. Um, I imagine I'll have a chauffeur for my funeral uh, after 120. But uh, that's another question. Okay. So now back to this uh, conversation between Rabbi Adler and Rabbi Soloveitchik. Uh, Adler's responsibilities were to pick up Rabbi, the Rav at LaGuardia Airport every Tuesday morning and to be available on Wednesday for city appointments. While driving, Adler had many conversations with the Rav. Uh, 70 such dialogues were later published by Rabbi Adler as 70 Conversations in Transit. And then he talks about the Soviet Jewry rally. The post Six Day War era in 1967 brought on a euphoric atmosphere amongst Israelis and diaspora Jews alike. This atmosphere spread to the former Soviet Union, where over 3 million Jews were locked behind the Iron Curtain. Many of those Jews began demanding from the Soviet authorities the right to immigrate to Israel. The leadership of this movement, later to be referred to as Refuseniks, carried out a heroic struggle against the tyrannical regime in Moscow. Some are given life prison sentences in Siberia. Public demonstrations against the Soviet Union began to sprout in Israel and throughout the Jewish world. Many YU students became active in the student struggle for Soviet Jewry, SSSJ. You may have, uh, you may remember the, the posters if you were in New York or came to any of those rallies. In the early 1970s, there were two leading Jewish figures who were vehemently opposed to publicly demonstrating against the Soviet authorities. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Nachman Mendel Schneerson, and Rabbi Pinchas Teitz. Now, essentially, instead, uh, th- their reasons were uh, that these uh, rallies were going to make it worse for the Jews in Russia. Right? When the, if the Russians start to feel pressured and embarrassed, they, they're going to take it out on the only ones that they can take it out on, uh, the Jews in Russia, and it would become worse for them. And uh, we should stick with the old way of dealing with these issues, which is uh, quiet diplomacy called Stadlanut, and we should bribe people, and we should try to convince people behind the scenes, but not embarrass anyone in public, again, for fear of making it worse uh, for um, making it worse. Okay, one second, uh, Mr. Opart, hold on. The Rav, however, took the position that the Jewish community ought to raise its voice publicly on the matter and show its deep concern for fellow Jews in trouble. Remember what Rabbi Salvechik said about how the Jewish community acted during the Shoah. By Aaron Lichtenstein, then the Rosh Kolel at YU, and then ultimately uh, became Rabbi Salvechik's son-in-law, released his students for purposes of participating in these demonstrations. 
Regarding the Rav's attitude on this matter, he once told me that he did not want to be held guilty for the identical sin twice in one lifetime, which we saw above. He was referring to the commandment, Lo Tamol Adamriyacha, the verse we studied together, not to stand idly by one's brethren and suffer. During the chilling days of the Holocaust, the Rav believed that he, along with the bulk of the American Jewish community, did far too little on behalf of our suffering brethren under Nazi occupation. The Rav felt that he could repent in a small way by taking the activist approach to the Soviet Jewry issue. In a conversation I had, and this is now uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik speaking, I believe, in a conversation I had in 1983 with Yosef Mendelovich, a famous refusenik from those days, regarding whether or not he was aware while in solidar solitary confinement in Siberia of all the demonstrations taking place in the West on his behalf, he noted that he was not absolutely certain that it was the force of the demonstrations which brought down the Soviet government in 1989. However, he did know about the demonstrations going on and they gave him strength to continue to survive the ordeal for 10 years. That's another reason why uh, maybe perhaps Rabbi Soloveitchik was in favor, not only because he wanted to not have a twin sin, right, the sin of not standing up for our brothers, which he felt the Jewish community failed uh, in relation to the Shoah, but also uh, it helps uh, it helps the um, it helps the soldiers. And I, I will tell you, it helps. I'm sorry, it helps. The, it helps the refuse next. We saw uh, feel strength. I will tell you that um, there was a a, in my opinion, embarrassing audio recording going around of a well known Haredi Rosh Yeshiva who said that um, having our children write notes to Israeli soldiers um, is a waste of time, and it's not chinuch. And that doesn't help. What helps uh, is davening and tehillin. And uh, so I happen to know firsthand that he's wrong, because the soldiers who we handed the letters to uh, told us that it helped. And in fact, I'll tell you this incredibly touching story. While our, the bus that I was on in Israel for our rabbinic retreat was pulling away from an army base, we saw a bunch of soldiers like holding up construction paper, uh, which I don't think was an army manual, right? Reading letters from little American kids with unprompted. It wasn't like we had just handed it to them. It wasn't a photo op. They were just sitting there reading these letters. Um, and they, uh, they, they told us it, it does, uh, it does in fact uh, help their morale to know that Jews all over the world are, are with them. So that is Rabbi Soloveitchik on this issue. Um, and a, a really interesting historical sort of shift. Uh, he did not feel that he nor his colleagues did enough during the Shoah. Uh, and he felt it was a real violation of Lo Tamol uh, Damriach. And then he, he did his own shuva, so to speak, um, and encouraged his students to participate in the rallies for Soviet Jewry. Okay, so we have um, a half hour now to analyze a tshuva, which is really going to be analyzing that first Gemara we saw about the matron. But first, Mr. Ropart has a comment, and I'll take any others, and then we'll get right into that tshuva. Yeah, so um, my understanding is that in the 1940s, the reason there wasn't more um, of a communal Jewish effort was for two reasons that you um, made reference to vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Jewry. One is that there was this sense of doing the quiet diplomacy behind the scenes, you know, so, uh, uh, specific individuals, uh, Rabbi Stephen Wise petitioning the government. But two is that there was a fear that there would be among the American Jews that their place in the United States was not secure and that there would be a political backlash um, to any attempts to exert themselves and it was best to just kind of, for the for their own sakes, to stay under the radar um, and not try and make themselves seen. All right. Thank you for that, uh, Cheryl. Um. So one thing I wanted to mention was um, I wasn't able to attend the DC rally, but I did watch all of it. And um, when Natan Sharansky spoke, uh, one of the first things he talked about was how the letter writing and the rallies saved his life. Um, sure. He actually came out and, and said that. 
And then he also reminisced back to the demonstration in 1987. Um, and uh, he just really congratulated everybody that either wrote letters or that participates in rallies. And he said that they're very, very important. I think there's also another element of this um, separate from the effect it has on, let's say, Israeli soldiers, uh, it keeps American Jews engaged as yes. well, which is incredibly important. So, th which is the same about the live stream, right? There were 290,000 people there, and I heard 250,000 people watching. So, that is, yes. uh, a, you know, a half a million, more than a half a million people, um, you know, participating in that in that rally and that uh, that the decision to live stream it also kept you know keeps people uh engaged which is very important um because you you know so you can't start from scratch and you have to you have to keep people warm uh so to speak okay let's um let's look at uh this chuva now i'll share my screen again this is a chuva written by a fascinating uh, man, Rabbi Yehuda Herzl Hankin. Um, we'll just go to his Wikipedia page real quick um, to see a little bit about him. Rabbi Yehuda Herzl Hankin was born in 1945 and died in 2020. He's the author of three volumes of response. I have up there, as you can see them, or four volumes, called Shelot Uchuvot B'nai Banim. And he is the grandson of um, Rabbi Yosef Hankin, who was the leading American posek for many, many years, uh, essentially side by side with Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, both of them living on the Lower East Side of, of Manhattan. And uh, for many of us who go to shuls where you see a gabai pulling out a little book to see if you say Av Harachamim on that day or what the Parsha is, or what the Haftorah is, that is a halachic calendar uh, written by Rabbi Yehuda Herzl Hank, uh, I'm sorry, written by Rabbi Hankin's grandfather, who essentially established what should be called Minhag America, uh, essentially established what we do in American shuls when it comes to those questions of what to say, what not to say. His grandson, Rabbi Yehuda Herzl Hankin, was uh, a student of his, a private student of his for, for many, many years eventually made Aliyah with his wife, Chana Hankin, which may be a familiar name. She's the founder of Nishmat in, uh, in Israel. It's the Institute of Higher Advanced Jewish Studies for, uh, for, uh, for women. And tragically, his son, Eitan Hankin, and his daughter-in-law, Naama, were murdered by um, Palestinian terrorists in 2015, right before Sukkot. They were actually on their way somewhere, I believe, for Sukkot. And now the children are being raised by the grandparents. Um, and he was a very, very influential, Rabbi Hankin is a very, very influential posek uh, in the modern Orthodox world. He, and he wrote about a lot of subjects relating to women's issues, uh, women's tefillah issues, mechitza issues, uh, and a lot of other issues um, that, uh, were very very important for the modern Orthodox world. This tshuva, uh, you see his picture now in the tshuva? I switch back to that screen. So this tshuva um, comes from um, uh, comes from volume two of his collection of B'nai Banim. And um, you see the date uh, is the fifth of Hanukkah, Tafshin Memchet, which works out to December 20th, 1987. Okay, that's when he wrote this tshuva, and it's Lishoel Echad, to a questioner. We don't know who sent him this question. And uh, we're going to read through part of this, because uh, he's going to analyze the Gemara that we started with. So he notes first that, so this was written in December 1987, and the rally in D.C. was on December 6, 1987. So this is being written right after that rally 
uh, in D.C. for Soviet Jewry that brought out approximately 250,000 people. I actually was at that rally. Um, it was a Sunday, and I, I think my school must have arranged for, for a bus, and uh, we went to that rally. And I spent most of the back. At, at this rally, everyone uh, printed T-shirts. At that rally, people uh, printed baseball caps. And I, I think I managed to get like 30 or 40 different baseball caps by going out from group to group, um, telling them that it was important for them to give me the, a baseball cap for some reason. Um, I don't know where they are now. They're probably gone. Um, anyway, um, so this was written right after the rally. So he says, Washington. <laughs> So in whatever, in whatever seor you were in, uh, you asked um, the question about Hafganot in general, right? Uh, rallies for Soviet Jewry in general, and specifically the big uh, march rally in Washington that you took place in. So this questioner was at the rally in Washington uh, as well. And then he goes on, this paragraph, this whole paragraph um, is a quote of the Gemara that we studied uh, about the source of Hafkanot. And so he says here in paragraph two, Shagabi mea Gemara, if ginu, l'achein en l'ashkiach, listen to this, b'mi shekotev shekulan hein neged ha-Torah. He says, first of all, pay no attention to anyone who says that all rallies are against the Torah. We know that's not true because we have an example of great rabbis from the Talmud who actually did this. So to, to paint all these rallies with a blanket statement that they're against the Torah, he says, that's just patently false. However, we should analyze whether the the particular types of, of rallies that you engage in, are they like the rally that we read about in Masechet Rosh Hashanah? So he, he lays out a number of qualities of that rally. One, uh, A, they, they asked an expert what to do. Right? So it's very interesting how like I've read that Gemara, to me it was an interesting story, but for Rabbi Hankin, it's an opportunity to to break it down line by line to see if the current type of rallies uh, match up with the only source we really have about this. Number letter B: Yehuda ben Shemur v'chaverav hityatsu baba atzmam v'lo shalchu al yedei shaliach af shelo hayabaz de bechodam lalechat alav. Fascinating point, right? That these rabbis, they're the greatest rabbis of their time, and they themselves went to speak to this particular woman, this particular expert. And they didn't send an emissary thinking, no, this is not, you know, we have better things to do. This is not keeping in our kavod. Uh, let someone else go and report that to us. They themselves, like the religious leadership, I think that's his point, right? They did it. She, the Matronita, advised them to rally, to protest. Upeirush Rashi, well, how's Rashi explain what she told them to do? Fascinating. Go to the public areas because that's where the government, the governmental officials are going to hear you. Right, the 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 the, the hafgana has to has to has to have a target. Right, you can't just be screaming into the into the void. Has to have a target. D, the amru, ba'u v'skinu. She said, "Come here, and protest." The lo lechu v'skinu ki dirata ha'ita ben haromaim. She says, "Come here and protest," because she lived near these governmental people. Leave, like get on a bus, or get on a plane from Denver, and go to Washington. Right? You can't do it 
from Denver. You can't do it from Philadelphia. You can't do it from Florida, California. You have to go to where the people are. E. The Amra Lahem Lahafkin Balaila. She told them to protest at night. And so Rav Hankin says, Lama Balaila. Because there's just too much hullabaloo back then going on during the day. For your people are not going to pay attention. So therefore, Hankin says, it doesn't mean that you could only protest at night. You have, to, you have to find the time to protest where people will hear you or even through the day off where people can come, where more people can come. So the 87 rally was actually on Sunday. Um, but for some reason, timing or urgency, the people who put this rally together felt they couldn't wait till a Sunday. And so they did it, I think it was a Tuesday. Um, so, but the point is, do it at a time where people are going to pay attention. F. Vitochen Hafkanat, Rabbi Huda ben Shemuel, Chavirav. What was the content? What was the message of the of the protest? Shetzaku ishamayim lo achichem anachnu lo bnei avachad anachnu. He's going to analyze why that was an important, why that content was important. And here it is: one, shepanu lirigshe hadat vahatzedek. So this may answer your question, Rabbi Hatzaki. Ishamaya. They're alluding to a religious argument, which they felt was going to work at that point. There's a, there's a, there's a religious argument here, and there's an argument of tzedek, an argument of, of fairness and righteousness. And as Bara said, B, v'gam lo bikshu tova miyuchedet ela shelo yuplu l'ra'ah. They didn't ask for special treatment. They just said, just treat us like everybody else. We're just like everybody else. Just treat us like uh, everybody, everybody else. It's unclear, by the way, right? Because the, the, the matron doesn't tell them what to say. What's unclear? The, the Gemara doesn't tell us that the matron told them what to say, but maybe she did, or maybe this is what they thought would work. And that's where Rabbi Hankin says, I'll call Panim, Hanusach eno ma'akev. What you say does is is not going to. Uh, it doesn't have to copy what they said. You have to have a message that's going to work. You have to choose proper messaging. And finally, ela bevaday tsarfu itam et rov bnei Yisrael sheb otom akom vuulai afin hanashim vahataf shekolan nishma yoter lerachem. They gathered as many people as they can, even the women and children. Maybe the, the sight of women and children would create uh, more of a sense of, of compassion. Um, and, and, and keeps going. Right? They, they, the impression made on the Romans was that this is a large, this is a national demonstration. Right? How is our nation different? Right? This is a really interesting close read by Rabbi Hankin of all these elements that, uh, which again was was uh, certainly the the message of the of the rally that met, that 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 took place recently in Washington. And finally, Umikan od tam lafkin balayla. Another reason to do it at night. V'gam kadei sheyochlu rabim lafkin ki balayla kol penuyim yavoda v'gam hanashim tochalna lahaniach yiladeya. More people are, were available at night back then. Um, and so um, that's why they did it at night. So this is Rabbi Hankin's sort of analysis of what they did. And then he goes on, and we're gonna, we'll try to get, get into some of this, to what happened back then in Washington. And while we're doing this, I'll ask you, to uh, think if what we did in Washington in either 87 or just recently, right, matches up to this or does it have to match up? Uh, I have my own thoughts about this. Like, on one hand, I, I love this. 
because I think it's fascinating. On the other hand, I'm like, you know, people's lives are at stake. It doesn't really matter whether someone did it in the past or not. I don't think we need necessarily a precedent of a previous rally to allow us to rally. Uh, but nonetheless, this is an interesting way to think through what's the best way to, to do this, uh, from at least from a Jewish perspective. Okay, so Rav, Rav Hankin says as follows. This is a letter G. So not compare what the Talmud records to what you did. So here's a first glaring difference between the Gemara, the Soviet Union, and what we did. The time of the Gemara, right, they are protesting against religious uh, persecution, which is also what they were do. what we were, well, not, not only, but a big part of what we were rallying for in 87 also was against religious persecution in Russia, although not only. It was also about freedom to emigrate. Uh, and the rally in, in 2023 was not about religious persecution at all. Right? The rally was about anti-Semitism, although it's sort of the religious persecution, but not not quite. And it was a, and it was a rally, you know, for support of Israel and against uh, against obviously against Hamas. So it doesn't match up. I'd love to hear if you have any thoughts uh, about that. But let's see what Rabbi Hankin says in this paragraph. Then I'll stop for a moment. Who says now also now it's been 60 years since they outlawed Torah study in Russia. Additionally, the fact that they don't allow any uh, Moalim to train, it's also it's as if they've outlawed, outlawed Mila. And similarly, they've created a situation where it's impossible to uh, to keep uh, to keep Shabbat. So what's interesting about Rav Hankin here is he actually does want to view this Gemara in Rosh Hashanah as a necessary precedent for what we do. What we do has to match up with what happened back in the time of the Gemara. And she says, so far, so good when it comes to Russian Jewry. I'm not so sure if it matches up to the rally that we had. Uh, we haven't talked yet about uh, saving lives and things like that, um, but there's no easy sort of way to match it up. Okay, let me stop here and see if anyone has any comments or concerns or questions about what Rav Hankin has said uh, thus far, and then and then we'll continue. So anyone have any uh, questions to comments or questions? Uh, Rabbi. I I'm actually surprised at what he says. I, I would have expected a bit of a broader... I would have expected a bit of a broader uh, approach. Um, certainly in the general, because he's answering a Prat and a Klal kind of question. He's answering a question about in general, it was specifically about that particular rally, uh, you know, for Soviet Jewry back then. Rav Soloveitchik might disagree with this. Rav Soloveitchik, who talked about a common fate and a reaching out. I mean, I, I'm real. I'm I'm surprised. Uh, this is not characteristic, I think, of his other two votes. I have a similar reaction, um, and I agree there. Rabbi Salvechik would not only disagree on this notion of common fate. Um, Rabbi Salvechik explicitly notes lo tamod al damriacha. Right, and it can't only be that you could only rally because you can't learn Torah. You must be able to rally because they're going to kill you, <laughs> right? Right. And that, that seems to be obvious. Um, we're going to get a little bit, Rabbi, Rabbi Hank is going to get a little bit into it a little bit more. But yeah, that was a reaction that I had as well. It, it felt like this sort of very 
um, strict constructualism, right? Of of uh, uh, in this case, Rabbi Hankin seems to be a strict constructionist in terms of the the constitution of this question is the hafgana in Masachat Rosh Hashanah, and if it doesn't really very carefully match up uh, to those points, uh, we can't imagine another reason to to do it. But let's let's move on and see if that changes. But I had a similar reaction. I see from people nodding their heads on the screen that other people also had uh, a similar a similar thing. Okay. Um, anyone else? I don't see anyone else. Rabbi Gerson, did you unmute? I'll I'll wait until the end because I want to reflect on the whole thing. So keep okay. going. Okay. Excellent. Looking forward to that. Okay. So let's uh, let's continue. Um, Rabbi Hankin goes on and says that in the Brita, this is letter H, they rallied Kadesh Yishmu Hastarim in order so that the government ministers would hear. We, we gather in a, in a public place. And the large number uh, of, of, of protesters leaves an impression and it it becomes uh, well known, and now Ahad Kama Vakama, right? Obviously, in, in '87 there wasn't uh, there wasn't social media, so like we said in '87, it was it was 250,000 people and whatever was on the news for a few hours. Because of social media and because of streaming, this was over a half a million people, and uh, who knows how many millions of people saw live images of it because of social media. So that's that's a match. Because of, of, of media, the no dat l'shul tonot Rusia ki ilu haytabim koman. This is so, so we, we accuse them of being a strict constructionist, but here he shows some imagination. We couldn't go to Russia in 1987 to rally, but the fact that so many people came and it was so well covered in the media, certainly the Russian government heard about it. It's as if it took place in Russia. I, that's really interesting, right? And I wonder about that. Like, I wonder if when 290,000 people gather in Washington, like what the British government thinks and what the German government thinks and uh, and what other governments think. It's, it's, it, it may, they, they may feel it, right? And, and, and because they see real images and hear it, maybe they feel it. And that makes a, a, a Roshem an impression on their uh, public stances on these uh, on these uh, on these matters. We are deaf. Me menu ki yoter rigishim la data tzibur ba olam vi afilu me ena moila kafkanabim komam halo berusia ef shar lafkin ve ein dan ef shar mi ef shar. And uh, you know that's the best we can do. We couldn't go to Russia, and we we had uh, we we had we had no choice. And again, I think the fact that there are another half a million people watching it also makes makes an impression. So the, the idea of, of doing it in a way that is going to um, have the, the, the largest impression on, on, on various governments was important, was, was part of the read of how Rabbi Hankin understood what was going on in the Gemara. Um, and then he talks about they did it at night, and certainly America on, on Sunday is a day off, so you do it in, the, in a place where pe most people will, will be able to come. Uh, and finally, J, the Yesh Lihitya Eitz Bimumchim, the Afilu Bimumchim Nachrim. To do this right, you need to get the advice of the experts, even Gentile experts. The assumption in this Gemara is that this Matronita was not Jewish. And uh, Rav Hankin, in an earlier part of the Tshuva, which I didn't share, showed that in almost every place in the Talmud where it uses that word, it's referring to a non-Jewish woman. So we have to marshal the experts. No matter where the experts come from, we can't assume that we know everything. And on this, I'll share another interesting and incredibly disturbing thing, um, which I will try to get on the screen. Can you see this tragedy in B'nai Brock thing here? No, okay, let me stop a sh stop sharing and then reshare something. Here we go. All right, you see it now? 
Okay. So this is a letter from Rabbi Aaron Feldman, who's the Rosh Yeshiva of the Israel Rabbinical College in uh, in Baltimore, known as Nair Yisrael. And before the rally, he and the leaders of the Haredi community um, told people they may go to the rally. They didn't encourage people to go, but he said they may go. And he said that he was promised that the the speaker's list would not offend uh, Haredi sensibilities. And then the morning of the rally, they got the speaker's list, and immediately Rabbi Feldman sent out a communique that people should not go. Now, it was it was too late for a lot of people because they were either there already or on the bus already. And one of the reasons he says not to go is element one. Everyone see this here, element one? See if I can make it a little bigger. Uh, okay. He writes, a Christian pastor was set to address the crowd. He is the head of an evangelical Christian denomination, which believes that Jews need to be supported so they eventually convert to Christianity. Even though the pastor has shown enormous support for Israel in the past, and even though he has 10 million supporters, nevertheless, our community cannot have such a person as its spokesman. Therefore, no matter how much I appreciate the pastor's efforts on behalf of Jews, I could not support having him speak at the rally. First, I could not know what he planned to say. Second, even if his speech would be harmless, having a Christian leader speak to Jewish audience is a step towards interfaith acceptance. Many people, especially young people in the audience, could conclude he says all the right things. What's wrong, after all, with being a Christian? Pikuach Nefesh is not an excuse for honoring a foreign religion. Okay, so that was one of his arguments. So I just want to address one part of that. And that is that John Hagee, if you Google John Hagee's name, you will find that his co-religionists actually consider to him, him to be a heretic. Why is he a heretic? Because he's the only one who says that Jews don't need to convert. Muslims need to convert. Hindus need to convert. You name it. Every other religion needs to convert to Christianity to be saved. But since we are God's originals, according to him, we have a free pass. Right? So you have to remember, right, that Rav, the, the, Rav Hankin says that you have to, before you make decisions on how to rally, you have to speak to an expert. So I, I wonder, like, had Rav Feldman just Googled, I, I'm assuming he doesn't use a computer, but had he asked one of his students, who is this guy? And what does he believe? He would have found out that he's not like every other evangelical. In fact, he has been put in cheyrum by most of the other evangelicals because of his unique belief about uh, the Jewish place uh, in, in eschatology. Um, so it's just a shame, right, that, that part of the reason he told his, his followers not to go was really based on false information, information that is available in seconds uh, with the click of a mouse or, or whatever it is. So that, that just makes what Rav Hankin said so much more powerful uh, about the need to um, about the need to, uh, to speak to an expert. So I see that the Lisa Perlmutter has come to live in Yeshiva Lane. Lisa, I'd love you to ask them if they went, if they didn't go, um, what their thinking was on this. Okay, we'll get back to the Chuva in a minute, but I'll take uh, Bara's question. So I have a question. Wouldn't uh, trying to save a Jewish life trump just about anything? And I'm assuming that the yeah, demonstration kind of was as in like we're we're really trying to save as many lives of the hostages as we can. And so yeah. basically anything goes in a way. Almost, almost, except for idolatry, the big three, right? <laughs> um, so if Rabbi Feldman's gonna take his argument that it's possible, and I think this is so far-fetched, meaning like have a little bit more faith in your own students that they're not gonna hear. A, a Christian for ten minutes and 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 like go to the nearest church to convert, right? That that's that worry. If that's real, then I guess maybe Rabbi Feldman has a point. But is that real? Is that true? Like, are we so weak 
that when we hear a, a, an evangelical make a good point, that we say, ah, I should also be Christian. I just think that that is a very far-fetched co comment, and it also speaks to a complete lack of confidence of our own product. Like, do you believe that you've been so ineffective for the last how many years you've been teaching Torah that now your students are going to switch teams? I don't know. The whole argument seems very strange to me. Um, so, but but what I do know is that he's wrong on the facts of of um, of Hagee. Okay, so that's about speaking to um, an expert. Let's let's continue. We're a little over time already, uh, so I want to move through this fast. Um, so. Umasha Shalta Al Shechad Meir Gunei Rabbanim Bar Tzot Habrit Pirsim Easter Lahafkin. He says back in eighty seven, a rabbi published that you're not allowed to go in the name of Moshe Feinstein. Vilu Irgun Rabbanim Acher Tamach Pafkan Alafim Masha Mar Lahem Bishato Harav Salavechik. Right. So maybe Rabbi Feinstein said no. Rabbi Salavechik said yes. He nailed the Atayti Kevan Sheinian Hafkanot Nilmad Mehagemara. Rak Tzarich Lidok Lefnei Kol Hafkana Ha'im Titzmach Mimena To Elat. Oh, low, Kamosha Katavti. So now Rabbi Katavti, he broadens himself a little. He says, this is really an interesting piece. He says, you're telling me there are fine things for me. And someone else is telling me there are other, Rabbi Soloveitchik said, yes. And you know what Rabbi Hankin says? He says, it doesn't matter. It's amazing. Just think for yourself. Open up the Gemara. Read about the Hafkana and the Gemara. And if you think that this rally is going to bring in his language, I'll highlight it. Ha'im titzmach mimena to'elet olo. Is this rally going to have the effect you think it should have? If it should, if it will, go. If it won't, don't go. Meaning, it's interesting. This is not a halakha question whether my spoon is kosher or not kosher. This is not Rabbi Feinstein and Rabbi Soloveitchik, you know, uh, material. It doesn't matter what they said. I found that to be uh, like a like Rabbi Chetafi mentioned, like a, a broader view of how we should look at this. It's not a question about uh, about Mila or Shabbat. This particular Hafkana has a specific purpose: get the hostages out, make sure aid continues to flow to Israel, make sure the law enforcement is paying attention to anti-Semitism. If you think the Hafkana is going to work, go. If you don't think it's going to work, don't go. Uh, so I found that to be really interesting. This is about the facts on the ground. And what, what a rabbi said 10 years ago about a particular hafkana is meaningless. Right? Because the the what matters is the facts on nishtana me'az. A lot has changed. And now he says something at the end, which is really great. Um, he says this: "V'yadua shagam hagon morei zikni tamid it naged lahafkanot." He said, "You my, you know, my grandfather, as I mentioned before, he was a student of his grandfather. He said, you know, my grandfather also was always opposed to these type of rallies." About this, this is amazing. But he also used to say that when it comes to factual matters, you can't rely on what the great scholars in the past said. Facts change. If they were alive today, maybe my grandfather would say something else. Ube'emet, listen to this, my favorite line in the whole tshuva. Ha'gidolim yodim l'shanot et da'atam. The greatest Torah scholars know how to change their mind. Aval ha'kitanim, the small ones, ain lahem dat, they have no wisdom. Ve'enam yodim l'shanot, and they do not have to change. Ve'tolim atzmam bedat gidolim bizman u'bimakom sh'alalu lo divu. And they base their decisions on what some other scholar said in a time and a place which is irrelevant. The Harbe Kilkulim Novim And a lot of destruction or damage is a better word. 
a lot of damage comes from this. We'll stop there. He gets into another question as well, but I don't want to take uh, up any, any more time. I found this to be a fascinating way to study this, especially that part at the end where Pankin notes that whether or not you go to a rally is not a function of whether it perfectly matches the Gemara and Rosh Hashanah. It's not even a function of what Rabbi Salavechik or Rabbi Feinstein said about another rally. All of these rallies have to be evaluated on their own merits, and then you decide uh, to go. So that would include, as Barra said, Pikuach Nefesh. It would include aid, which was also part of Pikuach Nefesh. It would include making sure the government is staying on top of anti-Semitism. Otherwise, these 250,000 people may vote for someone else, right? That's what this is all about. Uh, so at the beginning, it's it's like it's like a little bit of a head fake. At the beginning, Rav Henkin seems like really very like plugged into the framework of the Gemara, but then he broadens himself a little bit, uh, especially when he talks about changing uh, changing the tziut. Uh, there's more to say about Hafkanot. By the way, in Israel, lots of the Hafkanot are against, let's say, Shabbos desecration, and that is a, that's a whole other really fascinating conversation. Maybe we'll do that another time. Um, but this is a little bit of the, the history. We start with the Gemara, then we skip many thousands of years uh, uh, to to World War II and the Rav's guilt about what he didn't do and trying to make up for that and how Rav Hankin uh, views these things uh, these days. Okay, I see Rabbi Chaitovsky and Rabbi Gerson. So I know Rabbi Gerson wanted to sum up, so we'll go Rabbi Chaitovsky. Oh, I, I think also that uh, Cheryl, did she, oh, Cheryl, did you have a hand up? Yeah. Um, so we'll go guess... Cheryl, Rabbi Chaitovsky, Rabbi Gerson. So, um, yeah, when uh, when you'd mentioned that um, in the 87 rally, you know, who was listening, was Russia listening, et cetera. I don't know if you remember, but the reason the rally was scheduled when it was is because Gorbachev next was day. visiting the United States for the very first time. Yeah, so the they very wanted to make an impression on him while he was yeah. here. Yes, thank you, Cheryl. That reminds me that the very next day in the, in the Oval Office, yeah. President Reagan said to Gorbachev, listen, I had 250,000 people in my backyard right. yesterday screaming about the way you're treating the Jews. And that apparently opened up um, Glasnost and, um, not Glasnost, but- uh, the, Perestroika. Like the, Perestroika and the, 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 um, the Iron Curtain a little bit. Okay, yeah. uh, Rabbi Gerstin, I give you the last word. What about Rabbi Katowski? No, no, I, I, I cede my time back to the speaker. Okay. Um, so, Yasha Koach, um, I think this is a great um, lesson in the discipline of Hora At Sha'a, because, um, I mean, to to your point in summing up um, Rav Henkin, there is, um, you know, there's a lot of um, um, halachic ad libbing that needs to be done because of the need of the time and not necessarily looking behind your shoulder to see what you know the the predecessors did um so that that's thought number one um thought number two is i'm i'm haunted by rav Soloveitchik's words i mean um quite honestly for the rest of the hour i was kind of distracted um because of the power um because what I think what what the Rav said is very much what we're what we're continuing to think now, and that is is that um, we as a as an American Jewish community we perhaps let down our brothers and sisters in Europe by not being more forceful, um, and there's this residual thing which I've seen a lot, um, um, you know, even before. Um, October 7th, in that we can't let that happen again. And some of the most vociferous people in my testimony um, to argue militantly the case for Israel are descendants of Holocaust survivors. Um, yeah. And, you know, that that mantra that we can't let this ever happen again. Right. Um, right. And then the final the final thought um, and this kind of is sparked by my own involvement in community organizing, 
is that in addition to the world watching, God is watching. And um, right. these these gatherings in large numbers um, are ipso facto religious events because there's actually, you know, a, a bracha that we say when we're in the presence of a certain number of, of Jews yeah. um, that makes it a holy moment. And, um, and, and beyond letting down um, our European brothers and sisters and those who we for whom we stand in Israel, we can't disappoint God. This is our time to show our worth of being, having been created and living in this generation. That's a beautiful thought and maybe answers Rabbi Chaitavsi's question. Why back in the Gemara, they start with Shemaya? What are they saying? They're saying, God, see, we're here. Here we are. We're standing up for, for, for what's important. And now we're going to turn our attention to the Romans and explain why what they're doing is wrong. So that's a beautiful, a beautiful way to end. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, remember, next week, uh, Redeeming Captives, as a teaser, many, many people, almost every tshuva that deals with redeeming captives in the modern times turns to the Gemara that says you're not allowed to redeem captives for more than they're worth because that will just uh, inspire future bad guys to kidnap more Jews. I'm going to share with you a tshuva that suggests essentially that that is irrelevant to the modern situation um, and that we have to actually come up with brand new ways of dealing with, uh, with that question. A tshuva from Rabbi Chaim David Halevi, who was the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv and Yafo for a decade or, or more. Um, so hopefully you'll be back for that. Um, if I don't see you uh, before then, I look forward to seeing you. And hopefully I'll see you on Shabbat. And thank you for joining and have a wonderful rest of your week. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.